welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Come just the way you Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this. We are delighted to gather together this morning, this Lord's Day, where we might draw out of this world and by faith look up to that which is to come. We have a few announcements this morning, not many. Um, if you are a guest with us today, I'm glad you're here. If you have been a guest with us before and you've put your info in and you've heard from me, if you don't want spam, don't, don't put it in again. But if, you, if you've not been here before, uh, drop your name in the plate. We would love that. Or fill out the book there. We would love to catch up with you. If you haven't gotten your communion elements, you are welcome to do that now. Or when we get to time, you can make your way. There's some back there. Uh, I know most of you will not come down here, but you are welcome to come down here and grab them as well. Um, the Circle of Grace, you see the information about that. Their next meeting's coming up this week at Holbrook Park. And so if you're interested in that, uh, get in touch with, I don't know who. Um, get in touch with Krista Kruger, and she will tell you all about that. Thank you, Krista. And then... If you are interested in helping out with our media team, uh, with those who sit up there and um, make sure this thing's going and this, this mic has batteries and gets us online and, and gets the sound going, uh, they're needing some help. It'd be nice to sort of spread things out for them. And they're also getting things set up to, I guess, be made easier. But they're looking for those who would like to, to volunteer. If so, if you're interested in that, talk to uh, Dustin Johnson or Kentrell, and they will uh, be able to help you out with that. Uh, that's all of my announcements. Uh, Larry Chapin is coming with one for the congregation. Just before I said simply providential. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Don. <laughs> All right, um, I am here today to give you an update from the pastoral search committee, and so that I don't mess any of it up, I'm, I'm going to read it straight off the page, but understand that this is from everyone on, on the committee. I've been asked by the pastoral search committee to provide the congregation with an update regarding the progress and efforts for our senior pastor search. 
Uh, the session and congregation have established a committee for the purpose of identifying and recommending a senior pastor for HARP. As a committee, we've taken our responsibility seriously, which includes prayer and an understanding of church polity. We've reviewed our form of government, been engaged with the Presbytery's candidate and exams committee, and above all, we've been actively praying through the process as a committee and as individuals. After our last meeting, the committee has determined to proceed with a closed pastoral search, which will consider Nick Napier for the role of senior pastor. The decision has come about through following the standard practice of a motion, a second, discussion, and a vote. The pastoral search committee is aware of the magnitude of this decision, and we are also aware of our respons that our responsibility is not over. There's plenty of work that lies in front of the committee. As we proceed, we would ask you, as members of HARP, to continue praying for the committee and the decisions that will be made. We are instructed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 14, 18, that we are to pursue what makes for peace and the mutual upbuilding of the church. And again, Paul teaches us in Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, that the Lord is actively working within HARP through this process to establish the upbuilding of his church. Even in this delicate matter, we acknowledge that God's providence is at work in HARP. Thank you for your time. call to worship this morning sets before us the stark reality of our need, that our need is a deliverer, a savior, one who will be our refuge, one who will uphold us. 
It's also a reminder that that is not ourself. No one in this world other than Christ, other than God Himself, is able to deliver us and set us in the place of the need that we have because of our sins being met. And so as this call to worship is set out before us this morning, you get that reminder and then then you're called to respond. You're called to respond. Let's stand together as we are called to worship. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Together, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. For this I will praise You, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to Your name. Let's sing then. Let's sing number 310, Rejoice the Lord is King. Let's pray together. Almighty God, You are indeed to us a refuge. And we run to You and we know that You deliver us. We ask this day that as we turn to You, You will deliver us from 
all false hope and set us firmly on Christ. Let us look to Him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And Lord, we ask that You will call us out of this world that we might for this time be lifted up into Your presence and that by faith we worship You before the face of all the saints made perfect and the holy angels. Lord, do this, we ask, and stir us up and send us out that others might hear of Christ, that the kingdom of Christ will go forward in this world and the name of Christ will cover this earth that the waters cover the seas, even as He Himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. may be seated. As those who've been welcomed by God into His presence, who've been invited to call on His name and to seek Him, now we look at ourselves. We look at ourselves because once given a sight of God, we know, like Isaiah, we are undone. And like Isaiah, we need a remedy for that. And now we come to that. We're going to hear a reading from God's law, and as we hear it, here's the reality. All of the other nine, we can sort of push off and and do do okay with on our own, and we we think, well, I don't do that as bad as others, but this one's all internal, and this one's where you have to be most honest with yourself. It's going to tell you that you should not covet. You shouldn't desire that which hasn't been given to you. That that you should be content with what God has provided for you, that you might rest in Him and in it with thanksgiving. And yet, we, we live in modern America where you're advertised and you are hit with every day things that make you want newer and better. More and more, as if one more thing might make you happy. The reality is, if you're not content with the little you have, one more is not going to add to it. It's not going to make you happy or satisfied. So as you hear this word, know that God is probing in to ask you, have you made an idol of other things? Or are you content with such as He has given you? And as you are probed, confess. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's take this time and confess together, owning our sin as it is set before us. Let's pray together. Our God in heaven, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? We know that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. None of us do good, no, not one. We have stiffened our necks against your will, hardened our hearts to your word, refused to hear your voice, pulled away from your loving embrace, despised correction, and forgotten you in our thoughts, 
Yes, we have sinned against You. Father, we repent and come to Christ who has promised that in Him we shall find rest for our souls. We take His yoke upon us. We desire to learn from You. Grant that we may bring forth the fruits of repentance from sincere hearts which are precious in Your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If this day you've heard God say to you, come into My presence, and and then you've heard Him set before you His perfect law, the expectation that He places upon you, and you know your sin, and you have confessed it. You have owned it. And you've brought it to Him. And you can rest assured of pardon not for anything in yourself, but in His promise. And what's that promise? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stand together and confess our great hope. Knowing that Christ forgives sinners and that He is all of your hope, Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to Him, Christ by His Spirit, me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Amen. You may be seated. Our Scripture lesson lesson comes from John 16. Jesus says to His disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. Therefore I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. For with you, O God, is the fountain of life. In your life we may see light. Children, you may come down as Larry comes to give our children's message. Here we go. Now fully on. We're good to go. Good morning. All right. So you guys just heard Pastor Nick talking. He read straight out of the Bible, and he read straight out of um, John. And when you guys were listening, I hope you were listening, do you know who was the person that, that was being talked about? Who was the person saying the things in John? Was it just Pastor Nick who read out of the Bible and those were his own words? Or was he reading somebody else's words? Hmm. It's a big question, isn't it? Well, let me give you the answer. Those were not Pastor Nick's words. Smart man as he is, these were not his. These were words that Jesus actually spoke. And so as you were listening, do you know 
who he was talking to. Who was Jesus telling that the Holy Spirit would come? Who was hearing him talk? We've been, we've been having a couple of uh, children's messages come up lately, and this is the same conversation. His disciples, that's right. So these are people that uh, love Jesus, and Jesus loved them. We know this story, right? He, Jesus is getting ready to go on the cross. That's coming up. And that came. And now he's getting ready to go back up into heaven. And that's going to leave the disciples alone. Their teacher is gone. Their friend is gone. And they can't see him anymore. And they can't talk to him anymore. So now they, they might be kind of stuck. But what he is telling them is that he will leave with them the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit can rest in us when, when we confess that Jesus is our Lord. And the purpose for him coming in is to help us. Don't we all need help? Don't we all want to be comforted and feel better? Well, the Holy Spirit helps us do that through the Bible, through God's word. By listening to that, we actually get help from the Holy Spirit to understand it. So not only do we get a great pastor to help us through that, but we get something even bigger. We get the Holy Spirit. So as you all pick up your Bibles to read, you go up to Sunday school, or you go back home with your folks, don't forget to pray before you read your Bible. And don't forget to remember that the Holy Spirit is there to help you learn and guide you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you left your Holy Spirit here on earth to dwell in us and to help us understand and know you better. We pray that you would help us read through our Bible and understand what it says and to obey it and to glorify you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, before the mountains were born and before you brought forth the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. No one is like you, Lord. The heavens and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. You are enthroned on high and stooped down to look at what is in the heavens and in the earth. You made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Lord, you do not change. There is no shadow of turning with you. There is no one holy like you, Lord, for there is no one beside you, and there is no rock like our God. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. You abide forever, and your remembrance is from generation to generation. You are good and righteous in all your ways and loyal in all your works. You instruct sinners in your ways, and you are not far away from each one of us, for in you we live and move and exist. Lord, your love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom you gave gave to us. You have saved us because of your mercy. So, Lord, we seek your mercy as we bring our requests and thanksgivings to you this morning. Lord, we pray for Sam and Laura McCauley, who are expecting a baby in November. We pray for the health of Laura and the baby and for strength of both parents. We also pray for Ryan and Riley Streeter, who recently found out they are expecting a baby in January. Please give them a healthy pregnancy and prepare them in the coming months. We pray for Tammy Todd, who has a severe sinus infection. Please bring her relief and healing. We also pray for our independent and assisted living residents, Jean Liebner, Robert Brown, Shirley Brown, Alice Ingram, and Josie Barbie. Especially protect Jean Liebner from the flu that is present at Brookdale. And be with Josie Barbie, who has moved to Ransom Ridge Assisted Living. We thank you, God, for this further sign of progress, and we pray for continued improvement in strength and balance. We pray for Edie Dunn, who is to have surgery this Tuesday in her her doctor's office to remove basal cell cancer above her lip. We pray that the surgery will not take long and will be successful. We pray for Donna Knox, who has been having treatments for hiatal hernia and also found out recently that she has pneumonia. We pray for a complete recovery and ongoing good health. We thank you, Lord, that Bobby Green started his job at Home Depot on Wednesday, and we pray that you would bless his work. We pray for Pastor Lee and Joni as Lee is now transitioning to World Witness. We praise you, Lord, for your grace in leading them and heart through this time of transition. We pray for the pastoral search committee as they lead the congregation in seeking God's will for a senior pastor. We pray for our students from kindergarten to college, and we pray for them to make good use of the summer vacation for good times with family and friends and for growth in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We thank you, Lord, that Heidi is back in the office and getting caught up. We continue to pray for her daughter, Amy, and for her to have wisdom and hope in you and for stamina as she faces further treatments for cancer after some success from the chemotherapy. We pray for the town of Uvalde, Texas, after the murders of many children and teachers. We pray for peace, especially for the families who lost loved ones. We also pray for an end of random violence in our country and for a revival of repentance and faith. Let it begin with your people, Lord, collectively in churches and families across America and also in each one of us individually. We also pray for biblical reformation for our churches, schools, and governments. We pray for workers for the harvest here in our land and throughout the world. We thank you, Lord, for the positive results from last week's meeting of the ARP General Synod. We pray for good implementation of the decisions and for the peace and unity of the church for your glory. We pray for the baby who was abandoned at an Asheville hospital and has entered foster care. Please heal the baby of the drug addiction that was passed down from the baby's mother. We pray for the work that continues at Hope Remains Ministry and we pray for the workers and that many lives will be blessed through their efforts. We pray today for Melanie Jackson who is now in hospice and for Wes and the rest of the family. Please help Melanie to be free of pain and agitation and bring your peace and comfort to all the Jackson family. We pray for Erica Allen, who will be serving as an intern with Frank and Emily Van Dalen at the Connus Reformed Church in Lithuania. Please be with Erica as she will be leading young children at summer camp and during Sunday worship, mentoring high school girls, building relationships, and engaging in friendship evangelism. We pray that this will be a blessed experience for Erica and an encouragement to the Connors Church. 
We pray for Trey and Kiki Adams in Thailand as they will soon be hosting four interns this summer for two months of mentoring. Prepare and strengthen all of them. We pray for Reverend Zashan Sadiq and for proper treatment and complete healing from the amputation of part of three of his fingers and for a full recovery from pneumonia. We pray for the country of Ukraine and we join Joyce Layton in prayer for her friends who are in danger. We pray for Ruslan and Hannah Shishkevska who have evacuated to West Ukraine and are expecting their first child. We pray for a healthy and safe birth for them. We pray for the many that are still in dangerous areas, such as Pastor Ivan and his family, Oksana, Victor, Audrey, the elderly ladies group, and many others still in danger. We pray for the translator, Natasha, and we pray for the scattered congregations and that they would find other believers to fellowship with. We pray for agencies providing aid to Ukraine, such as Samaritan's Purse, Mission to the World of the PCA, and World Witness. May the funding and efforts be maximized. We are thankful to you, God, that the Witties have been able to put funds to use in sending aid to Ukraine in vans and bringing refugees to Toledo. We also pray for other ARP missionaries who are ministering to the refugees, such as Jeff and Suzanne Allers, Eleanor Griffin, and Eric and Laura Meberg. We pray that you would give humility and wisdom to the world leaders who are involved in the crisis and that their pride and hatred would be ended. We pray that many would hear the gospel and would receive Jesus as Savior because of this war. We also continue to pray for the people of Afghanistan, especially for Christians, as they face a difficult and dangerous situation because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for your wisdom and guidance and faithfulness for the leadership, staff, and congregation of Huntersville ARP Church. Protect all of us and help us to serve and glorify you well. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Now be with Pastor Nick as he preaches your word to this congregation. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated. Our text is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Word of God for the people of God. I wonder this morning, is grace still
still amazing to you. Is grace something that sinks into your heart and and at points you cannot even you cannot even begin to to deal with how overwhelming how comprehensive how glorious it is or has it in any way become just a word just something we talk about the grace of god we sing amazing grace and Interestingly enough, I've noted a lot of times Amazing Grace when it's sung is one of the most mumbled songs. I don't know if people are tired of it. They've heard it so much. But are you still captivated by the grace of God? What it takes for you to be made His children. Paul wants to do that this morning. He wants to reintroduce us to grace. Because we come to our text and it sort of catches us off guard. If you were just reading chapter 1 and you, you come to this, he's talked about the calling that we have, this glorious calling, and it's in and by the power of Christ. And he talks about this resurrection power and Christ is the head of the body and in Him God has given all the fullness of Him who fills all in all and you were dead. And if, if you're not thinking about this book in the way that we've been thinking about it, you might get sucked in only to a nice doctrinal treatise here, but Paul doesn't want us to have any part of that. He wants us to get a taste again of grace. He's reminded us of the calling of God, and that's what he's doing here. He's setting before us in depth the calling of God to us that he might then remind us that God doesn't just call us and then that's it. He has a purpose for us that we might walk worthy. We said that from chapter 4, but it's here at the end of, of our text in verse 10. He's, he's not forgetting that. He's getting you ready for that. And so then He is getting us prepped. He's wanting us to be pushed back into an understanding of the calling of grace in us. He's going to do that in three ways this morning. He's going to show us our estate, verses 1 through 3, our estate. It's pretty, pretty easily seen. And then He's going to show us God's calling, verses 4 through 9. God's calling, and then our purpose, verse 10. Our estate, God's calling, our Purpose. What is the estate out of which God has called us, from which He has rescued us, has delivered us, has taken us from our union with Adam and with, well, the seed of the serpent and united us to Christ? What was that estate? And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the presence of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul doesn't pull any punches, does he? When he's wanting to remind us of what God has done, he he. He wipes away any sugarcoating. There's no veneer. He comes in hard. You were dead. He doesn't give us over to flattery. Dead. In what way were we dead? Well, he tells us three things. In three ways we were dead. We walked according to the course of the world. We followed the prince of the power of the air. And we lived in the passions of the flesh. The world the flesh, and the devil. That's the course of life for those who are dead in trespasses and sin. So, where do we begin? Well, where we walked. Following the course of this world. Paul wants us to understand that left to ourselves, the way that we were heading was just following along with those 
We were under condemnation, he says. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were following a wrathful course. Let me illustrate it a little bit more. You, you may not know it, but I am such a good backpacker and hiker that at one point in life I earned the Three Blind Mice Backpacking Award. Because in the same week, I got lost three or four times with a group. And so I earned this award wholeheartedly. I can tell you how it happened. I wasn't actually the navigator. I was the grunt. All I was doing was carrying the, the gear for rappelling and stuff like that. And, and there was another couple of people who were the navigator, but we all had access to the map, and we would wake up in the morning, and we were like, oh, we've got a group to meet. We've got to get started. And we would just see the people going, like, that must be the way. And so one day we got started on that way and we kept going on that way and we never met the people that we were supposed to meet. But obviously this was the right way because everyone else was going this way. And it took someone from the group we were supposed to meet laying aside his pack and coming after us. We had a nice fun day, but we had gone six or seven miles out of the way. We had to make that up. And we had to go another 12 miles. Think of it's a walk from here to Pineville, right? And we had to do that because of how we got lost. But we had no idea. That was our estate. We were just following, well, the rest of the crowd. Seemed like a right path. Seemed like an okay way. And Paul says, you were following the course of the world. The course of this world is always in opposition to what God has do, been doing and is doing. That's what he says all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, isn't it? If you were here on Wednesday nights, you know that we've said the rest of the Bible is a footnote to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. But all the way back there, God had said, and I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. He's speaking to the serpent. And you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. And by nature, everyone just, when they're born, wakes up and follows the seed of the serpent. And it takes the work of God. Paul's wanting it to sink into you that it takes God Himself coming to you to call you back out of that estate, to draw you out from that way that you were going. That is the depth to which He came. It wasn't just someone laying aside their pack. It was Christ Himself coming for us. That's why our salvation is in Christ. He came and brought us out. And Paul is setting before us our estate so that when he tells us of God's calling, we might be amazed at the grace of God poured out on sinners. So those who are dead in trespasses and sin, they walk according to the course of this world. They follow the prince of the power of the air. You, you understand what that's saying that all who are in opposition to Christ are following Satan. It's stark. It's not a pretty picture that Paul paints of the world. He is disabusing us of the nice people having themselves a, a way to measure out and get to heaven on their own. No, your good works will not outweigh your evil deeds. As a matter of fact, you're following the the first and prime enemy of the Lord, Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air. That's what being dead in trespasses and sins mean. And then it says this, among, excuse me, that we, that we lived uh, according to the passions of our flesh. We, we followed the passions of our flesh. We all once lived the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of, of the body and the mind. What was our state? It was opposition to God and all about self. And whether we realized it or not, in that walk we were following Satan, we were following the world, and we were rejecting God Himself. That is the estate out of which God calls us from following the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And by that, 
by being spiritually dead. This isn't talking about physical deadness. This is talking about our hearts turned toward God. It's they're away from Him and to ourselves and to the world and to the devil. But, but because of that, we were by nature children of wrath. You're either a child of grace or a child of wrath. You're either a recipient of grace or you are a recipient of wrath. And that is, that is what Paul wants you to understand, that outside of the work of Christ for you, you would have not the weight of glory to look forward to, but the weight of wrath. It is such a weight that the Bible describes it as outer darkness. There, there's not even a modicum of light, not even a small speck that you will be able to see. It is the weight of God's wrath is to have Him pouring out His judgment upon you. And Paul wants you to have that in your mind when he gets to this next point. The calling of God. Verse 4. But God... being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are His Workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He wants you to feel the weight of outer darkness. Children of wrath. That He might expose you to the greatest height of glory that our minds cannot even possibly fathom in order to open up before you the Lord Himself who is so glorious, so spectacularly wonderful that He does not leave us to perish, but that He draws us out of outer darkness and brings us into marvelous light, First Peter says. Into the heavens. And that's why the very beginning of verse 4 is important. But God, but, but God, he, he uses a conjunction there. And conjunctions are important for, for those of you old enough or young enough. Depending on where you fall, you, you likely remember the song Conjunction Junction by Schoolhouse Rock. They teach you the importance of conjunctions, the importance of and being a, a linking one, something like this, I love you and... I want to spend time with you. They link, they go together. Or the word or, setting alternatives, right? You can have cake or pie. Not and pie, or pie. Not both. You, you can have either one. And then, but. But's a little different than the others. It's a disjointive conjunction. It essentially means that everything that has gone before that conjunction, you can disregard after you get to the but. Let me illustrate that for you. In Bible college, we had a young man that was newly married. His name was Ben, and he had married Michelle. And one day, Ben was eating breakfast with us. He didn't normally do that. We said, Ben, why do you look so down? Why are you having breakfast with us? He said, well, boys, let me tell you something I learned yesterday. We said, well, what's that? He said, Michelle made me breakfast in bed and she brought it to me because I'd had a rough week and, and she asked me what I thought of it and I said, Michelle, it is delicious, but 
It's not like my mama's. You understand the importance of the word but there. You also know why he was eating breakfast with us. That's a true story. That's not a preacher story. That, that poor man was sitting there with us because of that. But, and so here it is, Paul is saying to us, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were following the course of this world. You were following the prince of the power of the air. You were by nature children of wrath. But God, And he means by that to break you from that flow of where he was going that you might be caught up into the grace of God. Into the grace of the One who sent His Son that you may no longer be a child of wrath, but a child of light. That you may no longer walk in darkness, but walk in light. But God being rich in mercy. As a matter of fact, He's richer in mercy than He is in wrath. Never once in the Scripture does He say, I have no desire to save these people. They are, they are they're just undone. It's really a nuisance for me. No, He delights in it. And again and again and again, He calls to us, Come unto Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And again and again and again, all who come to Me, I will in no wise cast out. He takes delight in it. He moves to us in our sin. But He does say, I take no delight in the death of the wicked. And He wants to break you from, from the tr track you were running on that you might turn and see how rich, how merciful, how gracious, how glorious, how magnificent is His grace, being rich in mercy with which He loved us. And notice it's never impersonal. It's always to us, not just a general out there. Grace isn't just something out there and we just come and take a little bit here and there. No, 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 no. The great love with which He loved us and He made us and He raised us with Christ. Why? Why am I stressing this? Because we ought never depersonalize what God does. He saves that He might have you. That He might know you, that He might commune with you, that you might be brought to Him and be made His child. It is not just things that we stack up to have theological knowledge. There are a lot of people who take chapter 1 and they turn it into nothing more than things to fight about. But it is given that you might be enraptured with the idea that the God of heaven did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us that we might know Him. God's calling. God's calling is summarized in those first two words, but God. You were walking away you were in outer darkness. You hated Him. You stopped up your ears and closed your eyes to the glorious One who is above everything else. And you were saying, I will go my own way. And with your fingers in your ears, you'd say, what's that God? I didn't really hear you. And you know exactly what He's revealing and you turned, but God. But God being rich in mercy. He, he is bringing us in. He's bringing us in by His grace. We, we cannot depersonalize this. We cannot add some layer of separation so that, so that His salvation and His sovereignty become functions and objects. No, no, no. They are that we might know Him. And He brings us out of the way in which we were going. That way of of isolation and loneliness. That's, that's the way of the world. is to pull out and to be a part of nothing except of yourself. And He brings us into community. He brings us into right community. Perfect 
community. The triune God is communal in His nature and therefore He brings us into perfect love and fellowship and community. And He's making that into us and us into that. Because it's easy to follow the world and desire solitude, but it's also ungodly. You don't experience the grace of God in austere, solemn monasteries where you can just get away from people. And if you're away from them, you can just be more godly. No, that's not how God works. He puts us in together that we might grow up together. I'm going to stumble against you. You're going to stumble against me. And in so doing, God is shaping us and fitting us and drawing us into that beautiful work that He's doing And that brings us to our final point, our purpose. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see His calling upon you that it's it's great. It's it's rich. He puts us in the heavenly places. He's poured out grace on us and And it's not by our doing, it's by His. And He's doing it that He might together bring us along for His glory by building us up and producing within, not me, us, good works. What are good works? That's that's hard to define most of the time because we are generally looking for things to do. What can I do to have a good work toward God and for my fellow man? But the Bible doesn't give us such easy answers. But it's always to walk in love. What does that look like? Well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not covet. It's to walk in love. And God's doing all of this. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which He prepared beforehand. He's given them to us. We just walk in them together. I wonder if you see how amazing this grace is. What it is that God is doing in calling you out of this world. And I wonder if having seen it, has it become old hat for you? Let this word from Paul draw you back. Let it let you see your estate and let it let you see God's calling. Let it move you by His grace toward Him and toward each other. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give You thanks for Your great calling. We pray that Your grace will overwhelm us again. That we will be amazed at what it is that You have done for us in Christ. That in Him You have not held back, and so You will in Him give us all good things. And not a single word of promise will fall flat this in us and do this before our eyes in Christ's name. Amen. We come now to the table and here, here you get in visible form what God has done. The table is a picture of God's calling. What He is willing to do that you might be His, the broken body and the shed blood of Christ for sinners. And as we come to this table today, look beyond bread, look beyond wine, and be amazed at the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Is this table for you? Can you partake? Let me answer those. 
if you know Jesus, if you know your need of Jesus, if you know that so often you fall back into walking after the world, the flesh, and the devil, that you need Jesus every bit as much now as you ever did, this table is for you. If you've made that known to the leaders of the church, you've been baptized and you have made that profession known before the elders, this table's for you. If you, however, maybe don't see grace as all that amazing, you're, you're not as bad as others. And yes, you need some Jesus, but you don't need Jesus like this. You, you feel you've got a little bit of it in you. Well, come to this table. If you are at such a place where, where sin is more captivating to you, and you know that you need Jesus, but you would rather have that sin, don't come. Because this table is for us a picture, a means, a sign, and a seal of God's grace, but it is at the same time, for those who come to it in an unworthy manner, a means of judgment. And you do not want to drink the cup of wrath. The cup of blessing is for those who believe. But it is a cup of wrath to all who are unbelievers and come to it. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. And He said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim the Lord's grace until he comes. Let's pray together. Almighty God, set apart this ordinary wine, this ordinary bread. Set it apart now and to our eyes. Give us a sight of, faith, of Christ in faith, of Your overwhelming mercy that You gave us Jesus that no longer would we be sons of wrath, but that we might be sons of light. Set apart this wine, that no longer will we drink deeply in the cup of wrath, but we will drink deeply in the cup of blessing that is the shed blood of Christ. Do this in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Take the bread. And as you take it by faith, look to Christ, knowing the great and amazing grace of God that saves sinners, and cast yourself upon it. Take and eat. Take the cup, and as you do, look beyond it, and look to Christ, and know that it is His shed blood that allows you to drink the cup of blessing and turns you from the cup of wrath. Take and drink. Let's pray again. Almighty God, we give You thanks. We give You thanks that You have given to us this, this very glorious picture of Your promise that all who look to Jesus, all who have hope in His blood, are those who drink the cup of blessing. And so we ask now that You will impress upon us our need of Christ. And so we give You thanks. And we ask that You will give to us hearts ready to hear, ready to receive Your blessing. In Christ's name, Amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing number 471. For those of you who read music, don't read music, just listen.
God, lift up your hearts, lift up your eyes, and receive his blessing upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.